Good evening and welcome. This is the September 21st, 2020, 6 p.m. regularly scheduled school committee meeting. Call the meeting to order at 6 p.m. Uh, this meeting is being held remotely in accordance with the governor of Massachusetts, March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. And we have the full committee, uh, excuse me, the full committee in attendance this evening. So with that, uh, we will move to our first orders of business, which are the minutes. If I could have a motion, please. Move to approve the August 6, 2020 regular session meeting minutes. Motion has been made by Bill. Second. Second by Beth, discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That motion carries five to zero. Next. Move to approve the August 24th regular session meeting minutes. Motion has been made by Bill and second by Beth. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That carries five to zero. Come on, Antonella, get in there. I'd like to move to approve the August 24th, 2020 executive session meeting minutes. Motion made by Antonella. I'll second. Second by Beth, discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That carries five to zero. Next up. Move to approve the September, September 3rd, 2020 executive session meeting minutes. Motion's been made by Bill. I'll second. Second by Antonella. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That carries five to zero. And one more, please. Move to approve the September 3rd, 2020 regular session meeting minutes. I'll second. Motion made by Bill. I'll second. Second by Beth. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That motion carries five to zero as well. Okay, next up we have committee and sub communication. Um, who'd like to start? Bill, anybody have communications at all? I just wanna say um, that my daughter has started and I, as a uh, sophomore, and as much as I know she would love to be in the school because a lot of school is about being there. I know that she currently is um, her classes are focused, um, they're direct, uh, they are uh, learning things, they are not trying to go from, from one teaching situation to another teaching situation, they're not half time watching a Zoom and back and forth. It's, it's clean, it's neat, it's been, it's been well presented and I think that we've focused ourselves beautifully in that we're not trying to do two things you know, we're doing one thing and we're doing it well. And I think that we made the right decision. I know it's not a perfect decision, but I think for us, it's the best. Thank you, Beth. Yep. Any, anyone else? Oh. Yeah, I just would uh, take an opportunity to respond. Uh, there's been some inquiry in the past few days. We did receive a letter from um, Commissioner Riley from the Massachusetts Department of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education just inquire, an inquiry in terms of our timeline when we plan to um, make a decision perhaps on changing the model we're at. Uh, I just wanted to state publicly and we will do the same to Commissioner Riley that we have a plan that we have made. It was one of the three plans that was approved by the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and it's to go fully remote and we will make a decision by mid-December on whether or not we are able to change that model, uh, and that would be for January 15th. So that's the plan that we've had in place now for a month. We have had our staff uh, has had the opportunity to focus on a plan, and we know exactly what our educational process will look like for the next four months. We do have multiple students back in many of the schools, those students that have to be in the buildings, um, and so we have uh, brought them back successfully to some extent or another. And uh, we feel like, um, as Beth, as you said, we're on the right course and we're gonna stay the course to that regard. So uh, we will get back to the commissioner and we will keep moving forward the best we can. Okay, anything else? Okay, hearing no more committee and subcommunications, we will move on to the next order of business. We have a gift donation. Actually, this is for Spartan Walkway. Thank you. 
That's right. Yep. So oh, you, you want to take no, it for no, Nico, right? Yeah. There. No, I was just going to say that uh, in your packets is a letter from uh, principal of the high school, Frank Page, uh, requesting that the school committee accept a donation of $3,015 donated by Mr. and Mrs. Brian Nichols uh, to purchase a bench for the Spartan Walkway in mem memory of their daughter, Sue Makarowski. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Julia Nichols was a, is a retired teacher and um, her daughter, their daughter was a graduate in 1985 and she recently passed away. Um, they would like uh, the approval to deposit the check into the East Long Meadow High School gift account so they could purchase a bench in Sue Makarowski's memory and the proceeds will, re will remain in the account for future use by the high school. I'd like to move to accept the donation um, from the Nichols family for the Spartan Walkway. Do we need the amount? $3,015. Okay. Okay. Motion has been made by Beth. I'll second. Seconded by Bill. Any discussion? I just wanted to say that um, Mrs. Nichols was my sixth grade teacher. She mm. filled in for a teacher that had gone out and uh, she's a wonderful woman. She raised wonderful children, great family, and she was a fabulous person. And I'm happy they're doing this. She's a good person and artistic beyond belief. So thank you. Thank you, Beth. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded. Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That motion carries five to zero. I'll get that check deposited. Thank you to the Nichols family. Thank you, Pam. Okay, we have the next order of business, 6.1, the school committee rep for cafeteria negotiations. So this year our food services group um, is up for negotiations for a, a new three-year contract uh, and we need uh, one school committee representative to be part of that negotiations team. I've done that in the past and I'll do it again if it's the will of everybody else. Okay. Is there anyone who's not on a negotiation committee? I'm not on anything right now, um, but they kind of have to meet like after 3.30. So I'm willing, if Bill, if you're busy, but if Bill's happy, I'm, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion then uh, to appoint Mr. Fonseca as our uh, school committee rep for the negotiation. Um, I move to appoint Bill Fonseca as the school committee rep for the negotiations for our custodial staff. Uh, um, cafeteria 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 staff. Sorry. Thank you, Beth. Motion has been made by Beth. Second. Second by Antonella. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That carries five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, up next we have a request from the East Long Meadow Marlins swim team. They'd like to have practice here at the high school. Something so you, I'm very dear to my heart. We have some guests. We do um, have some guests in the audience. I think they would uh, like to speak to this. And then Donna's out there too, I saw too. Maybe we yes, can bring her. Donna, Donna, the, uh, Donna Prather, who's our um, recreation director. Okay. So uh, hello, everybody. If you could just uh, maybe, Charles, if you want to let us know who's here with you tonight and uh, what you're here for. Sure, sure, Chairman Thompson. Thank you for, for your time. We've got our Marlins head coach, Coach Cora Govin. Looks like we've got Donna Prather from the rec department and myself um, representing the Marlins parent board. So you have a request to use the uh, high school swimming, uh, the swim pool for the Marlins. Yeah, Donna, do you want me to kick this off and, and you can fill in any holes or why don't, why don't I do that and then, and, then, and then you guys can correct me wherever I messed up. So um, good afternoon, Mitty. Uh, my name is Charles Gray. I'm a lifelong resident of the town of East Long Meadow. Um, my father, uh, Charlie Gray, coached the Marlins for six seasons and at least one person on this board swam for him and may even still refer to him as coach. I do. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, so um, it, it might be near and dear to a few of our hearts. Um, I, I, of course, swam for the Marlins for, my, uh, for the know, six, seven, eight years and then swam for our high school team. Um, I was the interim coach for the Marlins for a season when we had an unexpected coaching vacancy in the middle of the season. And after that, became president of the Marlins parent board. 
Um, so we're here tonight to ask for your approval to get the Marlins, which is a park and rec department program, assuming everybody understands that, uh, back into the water for our winter season. Um, and I'll briefly go over sort of the whys behind it and then I'll touch on the plan and that's where I'll need Coach, <laughs> Coach Cora to help me. Um, so the, the whys I think are, are, are pretty simple. Um, in addition to the physical health of our children, I think we're looking to provide a safe environment for their mental well-being as well. And the opportunity to get an outlet other than looking at a screen, um, I think is, is everybody would agree is more important today than, than ever before. So um, our plan, um, our plan was was informed by our very successful Marlin summer program, and that um, and and our coaches got together and put a lot of time figuring out how do we, how we could make it work in this um, certainly rather strange environment that we're all operating in. So before I go into the plan, I, I'd like to personally thank all of our coaches for for all of their thoughts. Um, and, and creativity and, and, and what they've done to, to put together, I think, a pretty comprehensive plan. So the plan, um, in addition to following all of our state guidelines, has also um, employed some, some guidance from USA Swimming to, to um, have necessary precautions and protocols in place. I think what you're gonna hear is it, it complies with both the state guidelines as well as USA Swimming guidelines. So here's our plan, and, and we're stuck, as, as many of you know, with um, a small pool. We've got a four-lane swimming pool um, when other, other competing um, towns have, have six and even eight lanes. So we, we, we've got a challenge there, but I think um, we've, we've got a plan to overcome that challenge. So the plan is um, we will either have three or four sessions a night, depending upon interest and numbers. Sessions will be 50 minutes long. So for example, five to 5.30, six, 6.50, seven to 7.50, giving 10 minutes to sort of get swimmers on and off the pool deck in a, in a safe manner. We're, even though we have a small pool, we do have the, the, the benefit of having multiple um, points of access and in, in egress so we can have that one lane, that one direction flow. Um, while, uh, when, when children come to practice, they will be at practices in, in two cohorts. Uh, we will call them an A and a B cohort. That's a word that I never in a million years thought I would be using, but now everybody's using the word. Um, and swimmers will practice on, on, for example, a Monday, Wednesday schedule and a Tuesday, Thursday schedule. And depending on whether you are in cohort A, you'll practice three days a week on week number one. And then cohort B will only practice two days a week. So you'll practice on Friday if you're in A. If you're in cohort B, you'll be off on, on Friday, but you will switch to three days a week the following week. Um, we will have three swimmers to a lane. So picture this in our four lane pool. We'll have one swimmer on the deep end of the pool, one swimmer on the, on the shallow end of the pool, and one swimmer starting in the middle. And, and they will not congregate on one way. One, one end or the other. Um, that worked pretty successfully in the, in the summer team. Um, swimmers will be prepared when they walk into the pool. They will have, you know, underneath whatever clothing they've got, they'll have their suit on, they'll be ready to go into the pool. So they'll take their masks off when they're ready, put the mask on the side, hop in the pool, um, and away they go. When they get off, they'll dry off, put, the, put their clothes back on. The locker rooms will not be used. Um, so they'll change at home. Um, and they'll, so they'll put their mask back on and exit um, sort of the one way exit on the tennis court side of the building. Um, I think that sort of goes over the plan. Um, Coach. Charles. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. You, you spoke about the uh, locker rooms, not using the locker rooms. Is the plan to use the two bathrooms in the hallway though, if um, one of the student athletes uh, needs to use the bathroom, are we gonna have to have those unlocked? We have, um, actually, I can answer that for you, Mr. Thompson. Um, we have set up a bathroom that can be um, a one-person bathroom that's just off the pool, and so swimmers can walk to that, you know, lock the door, obviously, use the bathroom, and then come back. All swimmers can utilize that bathroom. Okay, great. Just working out all logistics here. That's, that's okay. great. Good question. And Coach Cora... Or Donna, correct me wherever I made a mistake. 
Coach Corey, are you going to be able to do uh, that many practices in a night? It sounds like a lot. Uh, oops, there we go. Hi, so I'm Cora, uh, Cora Govin, and a uh, new East Long Meadow resident, um, two little girls who have been on the team now for five years. Um, and, yeah, so what we have started doing the last – couple of years um, when there was a big transition in the Marlins um, there was only two coaches previously in the Marlins and one left quite suddenly um, I think it was like two almost two years ago now and so um, his only job was really coaching and and then he had an assistant coach so most of us that coach for the Marlins have other full-time jobs and so we've built up our coaching staff so that there's like five of us five or six of us depending on on numbers and who's available but that way it gives us more flexibility so that people are really only expected to coach two nights a week but then gives us um the the availability to have people to switch or if they can't make one practice then we can switch times or cover for people which we didn't really have before uh and all of us are lifeguards and previous either usa swimmers rec swimmers college swimmers high school swimmers or all of the above so um, one person that we're hoping to have come on and help with the marlins is ben o'connor who works for you guys and then is also the high school coach um i worked really closely with him this summer um at at pine knoll and so i've been talking with him a lot and we've been trying to come up with a really comprehensive plan to keep it as safe as possible so he's been great and then there's a former swimmer john tarbell who was a marlin and a spartan and then we have krista downs who is an aquatics coordinator at a y in connecticut then we have julianne gordon who is was a swim she just graduated from elms she was, she's a nurse and a lifeguard and swim coach and she was a swimmer there um and there's a couple of other people that are in the works um but i can't mention their names yet because they haven't committed so we have a bunch of people who have lots of experience um, that would be able to kind of rotate in and out um, on a, like on whoever, how many people we need to have there at practice. So it's not me going to be there all the time. I, I yep. teach also, so I can't be there every night, all practices. Great. No, it sounds like a good plan. Thank you, Coach Cora. Donna, if I could just, Donna, are you there, Donna? Maybe. Donna is aware of the plan. Coach Cora and Charles, she's uh, caught up on the plan, I assume. Yeah, we had uh, lots of conversations with um, Ben and some of the other assistant coaches and, and Donna and also Jordy from the rec department about how things went this summer at Pine Knoll and then how we could transition. And obviously we have to change it because the pool uh, fits less, less children um, and swimmers, the capacity, and then but also to, to be really safe because it's also indoors as opposed to outdoors. So just making sure we're even more diligent at an indoor pool and on deck um, as opposed to being outdoors. So sure. we've had lots and lots of conversations about that this summer. And the USA guidelines, if people aren't familiar with them, that's the governing body of all swimming that takes place in the United States. And whether you're a USA swim team or not, if you look at any YMCA, any plans that they started with, for people to get back into the water at their pools started with USA guidelines on how to safely distance swimmers for recreational swimming all the way through like collegiate swimming and like Olymp Olympic trial swimming. So that's pretty much what every single swimming program is using as their basis for keeping kids socially distanced within a pool. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Smith, any issues with the plan? None at all. Um, uh, Ms. Prather and, and Mr. McGee and Mr. Page um, uh, worked together and then presented the outline of the plan to um, us last week and we're certainly endorsing this and um, certainly would like to see the Marlins start up again. Great. Okay, any other questions from the committee? I did, I did have a quick one and so like when the kids are coming in there will only be 12 in there at any given time. Um, I'm sure they'll have their coats on, they'll come in, I'm assuming, they'll put down their coat, their towel, um, but they, they will have the opportunity, I guess I want to extend it if we can, and you say when it gets too cold for them to leave, I mean, um, they'll have time to dry off and put their coat on and go, right, because I don't want, they should be warm enough between there and the car, shouldn't they, to get a couple so of 
this is a really good question. So a lot of parents or questions that we got on the board when we met about this about a week ago was what are we going to do about parents who, who usually want to stay on deck and watch their kids if their kids are younger swimmers? Well, we've had to change kind of how we would sign kids up for swimming this year because it's going to be very, um, I don't want to say it's super rigid, but it's, it's not really flexible. Like if you're signed up for a certain time, that's kind of when you have to come. And we're going to tell parents that they have to stay out in their cars during the practice so that if an emergency did happen, they could come in and get their child because they won't be able to stay on deck. And since practices are only 50 minutes, it's not like a super long time. Or when they sign in, they have to give us the phone number of like the parent that's going to be there in charge of their child if anything happens. So when they come in, one coach will go over to the door. We ask a bunch of COVID questions. They will come in and they'll each have a spot specifically marked out on the bleachers. They'll take all their stuff off, bring their equipment down to whatever lane they're in. And then when they're done, they will go back to their spot, dry off quickly, put all their extra clothes or whatever they need to put on. And then they'll exit out the door, but their parents should be out there waiting for them. So they won't be outside waiting. So, I mean, obviously it's a little bit different than summertime because I would stay and if parents were late, like that wasn't a big deal because it's nice out, but we'll, we'll have to be a little bit more structured with that in the winter because it's cold and and they can't just kind of drop off and leave and come and go because the practices will be really short. Okay. Or shorter than normal. Yeah. All right. Okay, good. Okay. If there are no other questions, then I will entertain a motion. Uh, move, move to approve the Marlin swim practice at East Long Meadow High School. All right. I'll second it. Motion's been made and seconded by Beth. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That motion carries five to zero. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And good luck this season as much as you can get. Thank you so much. You just made a lot of really little kids super happy. <laughs> Keep them active, Coach Snor. We appreciate your efforts on it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for your okay. time, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're making some progress. We have our next item of business is the athletic subcommittee recommendation for fall athletics. Uh, and this pertains to the sports fee. So last week, the athletic subcommittee met with um, Mr. McGee and Mr. Page and worked through uh, an outline of a proposal, which, which we think um, is a pretty good one. And I think Mr. Page and Mr. McGee might be in the audience and maybe we can bring them in. There we go. And I think um, we may need to, well, uh, once they put on their cameras, um, possibly allow them to share the screen and they'll go through uh, the proposal just to break it down because there's a lot of moving parts as we know um, to this fall athletic season. Hello, Mr. McGee. Hello, Mr. Page. Hello. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, we have two athletic user fee proposals and we also uh, wanted to talk a little bit about spectators also. Um, so. <laughs> All right, so uh, the first proposal uh, is for field hockey, golf, soccer, cross country, and volleyball uh, to reduce that athletic user fee to $100. It's originally $149. Uh, this user fee will not apply to football and cheerleading level one practices. We'll talk about that next. The primary reason for this reduction is because the district will not be providing athletic transportation. A secondary reason for this reduction is because athletic schedules will be reduced anywhere from 25 to 50% compared to previous years. So if you take a look at last year, the transportation cost in the fall was $20,924. The 2019 collected user fees were $38,740. So if you're just looking at transportation, that left $17,816. Uh, 
So looking ahead to this year, if we anticipate the fall transportation cost to be $0 and the fall anticipated collector user fee to be $20,000, that would be based on uh, approximately 200 user fees at $100 each. That would be approximately $20,000. Um, so if you want to take a note of the fall 2020 anticipated user fee balance after transportation is $2,184 higher than fall 2019. However, there will be no gate revenue this year to offset that, that difference. Um, I do believe that the reduction to $100 for those sports uh, will not have a negative impact on the winter season or on the spring season uh, or on the athletic budget for this year. Um, and we had also recommended that if any athletic season is completely shut down due to a COVID-19 outbreak, then the athletic user fee would be prorated based on the time of shutdown and a family credit would be issued to each family. So that's the first proposal. Um, I can move on to the next one or I can answer questions on that first proposal. Yeah, why don't we do all the, the next one, Kevin, and then we'll sure. come back. If we, yeah. So the second proposal, this one um, is just in connection to uh, cheerleading and football because those are our level one uh, athletic user fees and the proposal is to reduce that user fee down to $50 per athlete. Please note this athletic fee will not apply or carry over to their competitive season in March and April. The football and cheerleading athletic fee for March and April will most likely be a higher amount and set in the future by the school committee. The cheerleading and football level one practices would be set at three times a week for an hour and a half. The cheerleading and football level one coaches would have approximately a ratio of 15 athletes per coach. So you can see that the amount of time and the athlete to coach ratio would be uh, equal between cheerleading and football. And since they wouldn't be competing um, and they would only be having three practices a week for an hour and a half, that's why we're proposing a $50 per athlete athletic user fee for uh, just cheerleading and football. Uh, and the third um, item is about spectators. Would you like me to talk about that now also, or do you want to hold up? Um, why don't we do the, well, let's do the fees now, and then we'll move okay. on to that. So questions on the fees from the committee? Nothing? I mean, it seems to uh, make sense. It will be good to have some reduction in that. Obviously, it's not a full season as it was before, so. Um, Seems to make sense. If that's the case, I will entertain a motion to approve um, the both $100 and $50 sports fees as presented. I'll move to approve the sports, the athletic user fees at $100 for field hockey, golf, soccer, cross country, and volleyball, and $50 for cheerleading and football as presented. I'll second that. Okay, and that would be for the fall 2020 school year only. Yes. yes. Clarify. Yep. And we should also maybe put that there will be a, um, why don't you add that there'll be a prorated amount if we have to shut down. Okay. Do okay. you want to make that the motion, Bill? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So motion's been made by Bill. I'll second. Second by Beth. Any discussion on that? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion carries five to zero. Okay, Kevin, now the um, attendees. Sure. So the third item is about athletic spectator information. So the PVIAC has made the decision. The PVIAC is our league that oversees um, pretty much all the Western Mass schools, has made the decision to not allow any spectators at indoor volleyball competitions. The PPIAC has also made the decision to not allow any away team spectators at outdoor athletic competitions. Therefore, based on the PVIAC policy, ELHS parents will not be allowed to attend any away athletic events. The PVIAC has left it up to the home team's school committee administration slash health department to decide if they are going to allow home team spectators. Uh, Amy Petrowski has gotten clarification from MassDPH that each athlete, athletic participant is allowed one spectator. Um, based on her clarification, um, the ELHS home outdoor athletic event proposal from myself and Mr. Page uh, would be allowed to allow one spectator per ELHS athletic participant for all home games. 
The athletic director would give each athlete an athletic pass to be used by one of his or her family members to attend home outdoor ELHS athletic events for that particular sport and level. One, one oh. thing that I uh, would right. add is that we are working with LCAT to um, provide live streaming of the athletic events. And I think, Mr. G Mr. McGee, am I correct that um, each district is looking to try to develop that, that live streaming so that away fans could see the game at least live streamed? Correct. So uh, each one of the districts, especially in our bubble, so our bubble is mostly going to be um, the schools that we would compete against would be Longmeadow, Minichog, Ludlow, Chicopee, and Chicopee Comp. All of those athletic directors are working on a live stream, uh, and we are meeting tomorrow, and each school is going to come up with a visiting school guideline. So um, we'll have information to send to the visiting school about how to access the live stream um, and if they have a live stream. So we will be communicating with each school before each athletic event. So, Kevin, I know we spoke of this previously a little bit, but my initial thought to this um, proposal is that it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that we would not allow visiting uh, parents to watch as they drive their students here because we will not be providing transportation. I know it's a numbers thing, but I feel for the home parents to stand there as the visiting parents drop their kids off is not... Um, I don't know. It doesn't play right with me. I'll, and as a parent who wants to spectate, I don't necessarily say that I don't want home parents not to watch either. So I don't know. I throw that out there. How's everybody feeling on this one? When we were in the committee, I, I wasn't even aware that the, I don't know, PVIAC thing was a thing. I thought the MIAA was the it. <laughs> and I said to myself, well, we're not giving buses. So these parents are going to come visit our, our turf, right? And we're going to be like, sorry, but you can go sit in your car. And, um, but you know what, when you go to their turf, you're going to have to sit in your car. So it's something's better than nothing, I guess, Greg. Um, and it's just how well do the adults sitting in their cars behave? And that's. The well, <laughs> here's the other, here's the other thing. They're going to stand along the fence on the outside. That's the reality of it. I think Bill, you're right. That's, and so it, to not address that. Right. I don't know. I mean, Maybe we don't want to address it. It's a tough one. Yeah. It's a tough one because you've got all the guidelines that say you've got to, you know, social distance and everything. So we talked about this on Friday. Yeah. A little bit and or when we met and Kevin, we're going to have some sort of police coverage here as well, right? Yeah. So we had talked about, I, I do believe the first couple athletic home events, it makes sense to have a police officer on property. Um, I don't exactly know. To enforce what, though? I mean, so is a, is a police officer going to escort a parent of another team off the, off the field? So it, it's, I don't know that's enforceable. Yeah, so I, I do want you to know that I do agree with you um, about visiting parents. Um, I believe in your packet was the actual statement from the PVIAC right. saying it no was. visiting. It is. Um, yeah. Fans are allowed. So I, I think I it's going to be a I challenge wanna, for I do every wanna clarify. school district. What, yep. I do want to Sorry, clarify yeah. that I agree with you. I, I do. I, I think our hands are tied with visiting fans with the PVIAC policy. Well, it's, it's both. I think it's a combination, and, and I agree with all of you. It's going to be a challenge um, that every district, unfortunately, in this new normal of COVID-19 will need to take on. Um, but I, I think it stems from what the Department of Public Health is issuing as guidance. Yeah. Because um, initially, when we first started these discussions, we were thinking we had to limit um, to 50 individuals. But the, the reality is, and then that included players um, and officials, coaches and officials. But that's been clarified where now they are allowing one spectator per athlete. Well, but this is PVIAC. Do they, what is their authority, Gordon? Let me ask you that over how we operate? Well, they're, they're in charge of our league. So to a certain extent, they can issue um, situations where, you know, we have to pay certain penalties or uh, are not allowed to compete. Mr. Page, you had something you wanted to? Yeah, so 
I was going to chime in. I think the volleyball one is easy to explain first. I can start there. Um, so the reason why we're, we're saying no spectators for volleyball is we have a, um, a, a capacity of um, people allowed to be in the gym at one time, and, and that number is at 50. So once you factor in the, the two teams, coaching staff, officials, right. you're pushing such a high number anyway, you'd be limited to very few people who could actually potentially attend that game. Uh, I don't think there's any dispute yeah. in with that one, Frank. I yeah, don't, it's, I, it's, yeah, well, it's well, on that one uh, in the second piece with um, the outdoor athletics. Uh, so I do serve on the PBIC board, um, and we had this conversation. I will say, similar to what Kevin said, I did um, take the stance of advocating for uh, visiting families to um, few and attend those games, uh, but. The, the concern amongst a number of people on the board and uh, amongst uh, a number of the other districts is uh, the management and regulation of outside visitors attending those games, um, both prior and during. Um, th there are some districts who are talking about having no fans period. Uh, so they wanted to just make sure that there was consistency in messaging across all of uh, the different schools in the PVIAC. So everybody understood what those expectations would be. So when you arrived at those sites, uh, you knew you'd be dropping your child versus something varying from school to school um, and making sure that the um, the home fan base would have that opportunity to to view that game. So, but just play this out with me a little bit. If we're in the backfield here at the high school for a soccer game and there's parents from the other team who drop their students off and park their car and then they sit in their car and watch the game, is that okay? I think we're going to let, allow common sense to prevail in that situation. We're not going to make somebody, you know, exit the entire grounds um, okay. and go wait at Dunkin' Donuts. I think. That but to that point, if they st sit on the hood of their car, is that change it? This is, a, and I'm just saying these things not to be smart. I'm saying these yeah. things that they're logistics. That if I'm going to bring my daughter to play a soccer game. I will probably sit in the car to watch, and I may try to stand outside the fence to watch the game. I'm just going to be about if you're if you're going to an opposing school. Correct. So uh, now I'm going to follow the rules that we decide on. Let me scratch that. What I would like to do is stand outside the fence, but I will follow the rules. However, I'm just trying to make the point that to say that said. no fans are going to watch the game, I think, is unreasonable unre because they're going to commingle with our fans anyway, and then we're going to check passes. Are we? I think if they're playing in the stadium, we will yeah. be checking the passes that are issued um, through Mr. McGee. If you're talking about a um, sub varsity game, say on the back fields here, here, obviously if people are within their car or you know on the hood of their car, um, as long as they're legally parked, I don't think we would be escorting people out. The challenge actually for back here is who is legally parked because when it gets crowded. Mm -hmm. Um, they yeah. block the fire lane and so forth. And so that becomes more of an issue than, say, rowdy fans, if you will. And, Greg, just to that point, I, I think the um, the concern is less about the sub-varsity sports. It's more about your varsity programming and the crowds that might be drawn to a varsity game. Well, but to that point, if we're only allowing one parent per student-athlete and each team has 20 athletes, student-athletes, then two teams would be 40 spectators. Yeah. Right, we have plenty of stands for sporty, forty spectators to be socially distanced. I believe. So why arbitrarily would we say you just can't come in, even though we have space for you, specific uh, to the stadium? You, I think, I think, like Mr. McGee said, uh, we're on the same side in terms of the um, the thinking and and how we would approach this from East Long Meadows' perspective. But I think if you're looking big picture across PVIC, they did want to have a consistent message. So, um, you know, when you're traveling from community to community, families do know what the expect expectation would be when you go from one town to the next. And I think that was kind of the big idea behind it. And I think they're also trying to stay within Department of Public Health guidelines. Yeah. Um, well, we, well, but if the guide, guidelines are 50, we're already over that with the teams and the coaches. So that's not the guidelines we're actually following because we're well, going to add 20 well, parents. The guideline is for spectators. Um, it's specific to athletic events, and it's a max of 50 spectators at those events. Okay, so at a soccer game, we could have one parent from every player, both teams, that's 40. That's all I'm saying. I mean, arbitrarily to say that they can't come in when we have the room for them, I think is, it, it does us a disservice because they're going to try to come in anyway. But um, Greg, the PVIAC is kind of this is their this is what they want, and so yeah. But I disagree with it. 
<laughs> I know, but you're. <laughs> we have to be careful. I think we have to be When's careful. When's your first game, Kevin? When are we scheduling games? How far out are we? So the first game would be October 1st. Okay. Um, I do have a meeting with the athletic directors tomorrow um, in our bubble. So those schools and I will. Um, so to that case. point, Kevin, can we make ourselves the uh, East Elemental High School an island unto its own and our policy, and I'm proposing this, I'm not saying we're doing it, would be one pass per player, both teams, welcome to East Long Meadow. Can we do that? I think certainly the district can do and make whatever decision they would like to do. Mm -hmm. um, however, the PBIC as a whole may decide to take action in accordance with their own rules, which could mean that we forfeit um, competitions and so forth. And I would say typically how a lot of these decisions get made, we are trying to, you know, look at what's, what's best for the entire conference, not necessarily individual schools. So a lot of times the, the buy-in behind these different ideas, even though sometimes it's a tough pill to swallow, like this one might be, is for the good of all of the schools. Um, and I think the message behind it is consistency. Even though, Greg, I'm, I'm just I don't like, I just don't like it, but I agree with you. It's an overreaction, in my, in my opinion. We're overreacting. We're outside. We're able to socially distance. We're having parents of other districts drive their students because we're not providing busing. And then we're saying, you can't come in. We're going to watch the game in our own stadium. Frank, can you bring this back to, okay, say we're, we'll vote. We'll vote as, you know, it's, it's stated, but that maybe they can rethink their thought. Like maybe after that first game, they might find, yeah, there's a lot of space out here. Um, is that something you can bring back to the PVIAC? Maybe you guys can keep that as an open thought process so that maybe we can get more parents in? Yeah, I think, I think that's actually not a bad idea is to see how these things play out and, and to see if these things are manageable. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are always things we can bring back um, for discussion. Um, and I will say, you know, this isn't just like a handful of schools. There, there's 42 schools in the PVIAC. Um, and, you know, it's... Uh, it's a big conference that they're, they're kind of trying to speak, um, speak for. And not to, to go off that, but I had one other thing like while we're discussing this and we didn't discuss it at the subcommittee and um, it just will say, we just came to me. Uh, is there any way that maybe we could allow seniors to have two parents? <laughs> So, so the, the no. math guy. No, well, this, this is the yeah. reason being, and I, I saw something that made me go, you know what? That's not a bad idea. I don't think it's going to add to the numbers. We have kids who are seniors. It is kind of their last, um, you know, hurrah. And I don't think there's that many seniors in any one game that's going to make those numbers go up. So at least then they can see that, you know, they might miss the away game, but they can be at the home games. Is that possible? Yeah. So, so right now the guidelines state uh, one spectator per athlete. Oh, uh, that's through them too. That's not just us. Yeah, for the state. So if those guidelines loosen and there's and there's ever an opportunity to increase, well, I think we can um, obviously do whatever the work with them, whatever the guidelines allow us to do. Okay. And uh, Kevin, and something just, came to me after we met last week. Is this just for fall or is this for the whole year? It's for so now. Okay. So we're going to be revisiting this again. I, I just don't like the idea. I think we're not being very host-like. It's a slap in the face to the visiting team, and we are basically saying because we control this stadium, you can't come in. I almost think we should not have any spectators if that's the way that we're headed, and I want to be a spectator. So <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm well, overthinking I, this, but I, I really – All the schools have to follow this, though, when we go and visit – other schools so everyone's doing the same thing correct yeah, yeah. well but we have the option of not allowing any spectators and other districts could do that as well some are considering that you you can always go stronger or stricter than the regulation but you're not necessarily supposed to go looser than, or less than the uh, regulation i mean we should almost do we should almost do then half of the squad gets a pass per home game and half of the visiting squad gets a pass per per visiting game I mean, this, it's just the nature of sports. Sports is supposed to be collegiate. It's not supposed to be, we're at our place, you can't come in. You're at your place, we can't come in. That's, I guess that's my only point to all of this. You are right. I suppose I don't, I don't the time doesn't have anybody cheering for him, right? Yeah. I mean, that changes the game itself. No well, cheering right. section versus a cheering section. Home field advantage, amped up. If well, you're Mr. not from here, you can't come in here. 
<laughs> well, Mr. Page needs to go back and discuss that with them, and you will go discuss yeah. that with them. Frank, can we say that instead? Can you? Can we? Could we inquire about? All right, if we have twenty athletes on a team, we'd like to give twenty passes to the visiting team and twenty passes to our team, and we'll rotate how we see fit. So, I mean, the state guidelines currently allow that. It's good. It's just going to be getting people on board with allowing um, visitors from other communities to attend. You know, the guidelines from the state already say that you, you can do that. It's one, it's one um, spectator per player on each team. Oh, so then, okay. So they're more strict than that. The PVIC, yeah. They, um, based, on, based on just the varying uh, positions on different communities, they wanted to put something together that was consistent. And right. So we built this beautiful stadium, spent all this money, had a huge investment, and we're basically saying we are not going to use it because other communities didn't make that investment. <laughs> is that what it is? I mean, really, I'm not being smart again. I mean, maybe I sound like I am, but I'm just asking that as a question. We have space yeah. for one spectator per athlete, 40 people. We could fit in that stadium and they'd be 20 feet apart. Yeah. I'm, like I said, I'm not disagreeing with, with your stance. I think there's ways that we can make certain things work. Um, I, I think it's every community has varying needs and obstacles. And uh, this was the way they were arguing for it to be consistent, but I'm not, like I said, I, I agree with you that I think, you know, if people come to our school, um, we should try to create an opportunity for them to see their kids play if possible. Yeah. Especially because we can do it. It's not that we can't social distance. We've all been doing it now. Mm -hmm. We're all being careful. We can mask all the spectators mask as they walk through the gates. If we need to have them mask the whole game, I'm sure they would do that too. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, and I have no problem bringing, bringing my, the concerns of the committee back to, back to the board and let them know kind of where you guys stand and as time yeah, goes, I'd like to do that. evaluate. Yeah. I'd like to do that before we've made a decision on it. We have time because we don't, it's October 1st is the first, we'll have a meeting before October 1st. Yeah. No, that's next week. October 5th. Yeah. And I'm not sure the next time the board's going to meet, Kevin will probably meet with the athletic directors prior. Um, I don't know if the board will be meeting before October 1st. Well, can you, can you go back to them and just say, well, like Greg was saying, maybe allow some spectators in, um, or maybe even we could just go back to the seniors. Like maybe the senior parents can like, you know, even from a visiting team, even if we could get just the senior parents in both ways around, that's something, it's mm -hmm. not great, um, but any little something that you can get for the kids would be appreciated. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. No. Ultimately, who's monitoring this and what are the consequences if it's, if it's not followed? Like in rec department right now, there's fees for coaches who don't follow these rules. So who is ultimately like the final stopping point for this? So are you talking about events that are at our school or events mm -hmm. that are at our Is it the coaches who are on the hook? Is it the umpires? Is it the referees? Is it the local cop who's out in the parking lot? Like who's the blockage? Who's the, making sure this is enforced? Administrator supervising the game. So Mr. McGee is responsible for patrolling the entire field if there's multiple games going on and well, pushing be, parents be, off. Uh, Mr. Page, Mr. Wright, um, and also we do uh, have teachers. Who well, and just to follow Sarah's point, one more step. So we're not prohibiting people from entering the campus at all. There's no, right. nobody at the gate to let them in and out, correct? No. And, I, and I know the answer. So to have a parent 20 feet off the field in the back, I know we're talking not the stadium at this point, it's unenforceable. I don't know how we enforce having a parent from a visiting team not stand just away from the field a little bit. You're talking on the back fields. Yes, the grass fields out back. Yeah. I mean, I get your rationale. I think the reason you, you see guidelines like these get put in place because uh, to uh, what Ms. Petrullio was talking about, my son plays soccer, I go to those games, you, there's, the crowds at those games might exceed 50. There might be 55, 60 people there. There's not somebody there enforcing every single game. I think the guidelines are in place where people have to use common sense and try to do their best to um, meet those state guidelines. You know, well, My concern is that if ultimately some kind of fee structure comes into place and then our coaches are all of a sudden getting fees put on them for not enforcing rules or these guidelines start to shift and then we're not in compliance, that that's a concern. But I don't want to see folks who are out there trying to coach kids all of a sudden be on the hook because our spectators aren't doing what they're being told to do. Yeah, so the, the fees, uh, Ms. Trulio, would come back to the school. 
um, any, any penalties that would be put in place would be put in place on East Long Meadow High School. Or allowing a visitor to watch a game. Gordon, you're, you're I, I don't know ultimately what the consequences are. I, I'm just saying that um, when there are rules violations by a host school, then the penalty is placed upon that host school, whether it's a monetary penalty or a um, default situation where they, you know, may end up giving up certain games or are not allowed to compete because of the stance that they've taken. Yeah, and, and I think that you see the PVIC make a recommendation like they are one to, for consistency, one for consistency, but it also is in place to help other schools, um, you know, reduce those crowd sizes and keep those numbers down. So when you know opposing teams do show up, uh, you're not exceeding that 50-person spectator um, state guideline. Right. So Frank, though, what I've learned through all of this is when we create guidelines and use guidelines, as long as they make sense. And yeah. people will follow them when they I don't agree. make sense. That's when people don't follow them. So to say there's a 50 person attendance limit. However, we're going to limit it at 20. And if you drove 25 minutes to get here, you definitely can't be here to watch the game. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. If we can truly have 50 in our stadium or on our backfield, and that's allowed by the regulation, then this stricter regulation will be difficult to enforce. And it's, I don't know. I said my piece. <laughs> it's like I said, and I think I know. I know the same thing. We're we're in agreement that we should allow our parents to watch these games and do it in a safe way. Um, but you know, uh, as members of PVIC, I, I do recommend that we, um, at, at least for now, fall in line with what the rest of the PVIC is doing. When's the next When's the next meeting for the PVIC? Any idea? Uh, for the so there's the athletic director meetings um and then there's the the board meeting we just had our board meeting last week uh, so i would say sometime in mid-october would be the next time we'd connect um i can i gotta i gotta look at the schedule i'm not sure off the top of my head would they ever do it under the circumstances it's kind of unprecedented right now i get that you guys have a lot of things you're doing anybody on that board i'm sure is going 12 directions but i mean could they maybe think about having one, if, if you're, they're finding that, you know, all the districts kind of feel the same way as us and, you know, like, like, let's try to get the seniors in or let's try to get more spectators in in some yep. way. And um, I don't know, maybe they might meet, they could ask. I, I have no problem asking and throwing it out there. Um, I, I did like what you said uh, earlier, Ms. Boucher, in terms of, um, you know, kind of seeing how things start and seeing if these things are manageable and then if things are working potentially layering in um, opportunities for more people to attend. Right. So here, my proposal would be, we have a meeting on the 19th of October. Yep. If we want to approve this as presented now through October 19th to perhaps hear again from the PVIAC before then, mm -hmm. I would be willing to do that. I, I'd go that far. I'm not happy about it, but I realize that the season will start before yeah the PVIAC will meet again. And I would, well, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Do you want a motion? Please. Okay. Go ahead. You want to take a stab at it, Beth? You want me to take a stab at it? So I move that, oh, geez. Um, that the spectator, um, that for the 20, for the fall 2020 season, uh, that we will allow one spectator per student, home student allowed at our games. Um, and I, I guess that it, that's it. Through, through October 19th. Through October 19th, okay. For outdoor games and then- uh, Oh yeah, outdoor, okay. Yeah. So for the uh, fall 2020 season, uh, we will allow um, outside spectators uh, to attend games, one spectator per athlete. Uh, with indoor events will be held without spectators through October 19th, 2020, where Perfect. we will revisit. Excellent. Kathy, good? Okay. I'll Thank second you. it. Motion has been made by Beth, seconded by Bill. Any further discussion? We need to You're clarify. Not... I think you said one athlete. Does it need to be specific I'm sorry, to one, home? One, one parent, parent per student athlete. Home athlete. Home athlete. Sorry. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. 
Happy you have that again. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That carries five to zero. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Frank, you're going to go bother people now, right? Because <laughs> you don't have anything better to do. Yeah. Sure. I have, no pro I have no problem doing it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We're just looking for a reasonable consideration. That's all. Yeah. And I will say that the board is made up of a great group of people. Um, and, you know, I think what they're, what they're pushing is what they feel is, is best for the entire PVIC and, and to make this work. And the, the big message that we're trying to convey across all schools is we want to really make sure that we get the fall right so that we can potentially do other seasons later on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I appreciate that, Frank. I, I acknowledge all those things that you've just said, and I appreciate that. that, that uh, and I know that everybody's just trying to – Making it as safe and as good as possible. So, so thank you for saying that. Okay, no problem. I appreciate all your support, guys. You guys have been awesome the last last couple months. Yeah, we're off to a good start. Thank you both for your time tonight. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I believe we have come to the conclusion of our meeting. And with that, I will entertain a, a motion for adjournment. So moved. Motion made by Bill. Second. Second by Beth. Any discussion? Hearing on all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That motion carries five to zero. Thank you and have a good night.